Okay, the session is now being recorded. Thank you, unit, for the reminder. And someone please also remind me uh, next week so I don't forget. I, I could have uh, been recording this from the beginning. Um, yeah, so if you have MATLAB on your computer, uh, you don't need MATLAB. You can, if you want to follow along. Uh, so basically, when I, whenever I teach, uh, in particular methods, I always use MATLAB or sometimes Python, but here at MATLAB, uh, because I think it's one thing just to like, you know, hear me blab away about something on a slide and to look at pictures. But if you can see it and interact with it in MATLAB, then that's uh, that makes it much more concrete. So I do, it, yeah. So do you need to follow along in, in MATLAB? First of all, you can use Octave if you don't have to do uh, if you don't happen to have uh, access to MATLAB. Um, uh, I think if you want, if you're happy with a kind of you know conceptual level of understanding of this stuff, then you don't need to worry about touching a single line of code. Um, if you want a, a deeper understanding of this stuff, then I do recommend following along in MATLAB. Um, whether to use MATLAB or Python, uh, I think, so my personal opinion is that MATLAB is a, a far superior language for numerical processing compared to Python. And uh, I know there's many people in the world who disagree with that vehemently. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of, like Python, the, the the culture of Python is almost a bit of a cult, right? There's almost this cult of Python. You know, people are into Python. They're not even allowed to say bad things about Python. Uh, I think Python is fine. Uh, it's a decent language. Um, it's free, which is partly why it's so popular, but it's also why it's not as good as MATLAB. If you have access to MATLAB, I would recommend sticking with MATLAB. Uh, otherwise, Python is also fine. You can do all of this stuff in Python, but uh, to be honest, I'm, I'm not going to translate all the code here into, into Python. So, uh, But you can also use Octave. That I will write that down. I, I also wrote this in the email, but there's a program called um, Octave, which, uh, which emulates basically all MATLAB code. And I tested all of this code in Octave as well. And it's free. It's cross-platform. You don't need a, a license for that. Okay, so uh, you can follow along on your computer uh, in MATLAB, or you can watch me. Um, I'm going to go through this code um, and basically just explain what the code is doing and how that connects to the concepts that I discussed in the lecture. And of course, feel free to interrupt me. Okay, so we are going to start by um, uh, simulating a signal. So we're going to create a, I call it a multispectral signal, but it's basically just a signal that has uh, two frequency components, so 12 hertz and 18 hertz. So specify a sampling rate and a time window, so it's just going to go uh, to, uh, it's going to be two seconds long. And then here's where I create the signal. So I initialize it to be zeros, and then I say in this for loop over the number of frequencies, the signal equals itself plus uh, sine 2 pi ft, and you should recognize that as the formula for a sine wave, multiplied by fi, which is the looping index. That's just to you know give us two different amplitudes for these two frequencies. Okay, so then we plot this, and uh, this is already a good. Well, I, actually, let me start by going to the next cell on spectral analysis. So here we just take the FFT, the fast Fourier transform of the signal, um, extract the magnitude. Uh, through the ABS function. So absolute value is the same thing as the, the, the magnitude of the signal. And this, is, this will give us our amplitude spectrum over all of the frequencies. Okay, so this is already a great example of the advantage of spectral analysis over time domain analysis. Because here, when you look at this signal, now, you know, I, I explained this, what, what this signal comprises. So but if I just gave you this signal and asked you to tell me, you know, what what makes up this signal, it, it would take you quite some time to come up with, you know, uh, a 12 hertz component and 18 hertz component that have different amplitudes. But you look at the amplitude spectrum in the frequency domain, 
and it takes you like 10 milliseconds to understand exactly what's happening in this signal. So this is just an illustration of one of the advantages of looking at time series signals in the frequency domain over the time domain. Now, of course, this is advantageous here because the signal is strongly uh, rhythmic. It's os oscillatory. You know, if that wasn't the case, then the frequency domain isn't always trivially the better way to look at a signal. But in, for these kinds of signals, it certainly is. OK, so what I wanted to do now is, uh, OK, so here's the question. So is it easier to understand the features of the signal in the time domain or in the frequency domain? Obviously, I just answered that question. Uh, and then which domain is more robust in noise? So what we're going to do is change this noise factor here. So you can see after creating this signal, uh, we add some noise. So I say the signal equals itself plus random noise. It's just you know pure Gaussian white noise times some noise level. So we can set this to be one, for example. And here you see the time domain signal is a little bit noisier. And the frequency domain is, you know, it's basically the same. I mean, this is like a tiny amount of noise. And you can scale this up. You know, we can set this to be five. Now the time domain signal looks really noisy. So you know, here's an interesting question. If I gave you this signal and I asked you to tell me what are the features of that time domain signal, you would be pretty hard pressed to say what they what they were. I mean, it, it is pretty clear that there's some some something rhythmic in here, so that part's pretty clear. But to say that there's a 12 hertz component and an 18 hertz component is, you know, I, I don't think you would be able to determine that from the time domain. But still from the frequency domain, it's still abundantly clear that there's these two peaks in the spectrum and the rest is flat. So what's interesting about this is that uh, white noise has a uh, has a flat spectrum. So the noise in the time domain is actually being spread. It's smeared out across all of the frequencies in the frequency domain. So um, so doing spectral analysis also actually reduces the uh, the apparent level of noise. It helps you already separate the noise from the signal because the, all the frequencies get summed together in the time domain and they get split apart in the frequency domain. So the amplitude of the noise at any given frequency is small relative to its effects in the time domain. Okay, of course, time, you know, spectral analysis isn't perfect. Eventually the, the noise is gonna get high enough that uh, even a frequency, yeah. So here, I mean, if you didn't already know that there is a 12 Hertz component in here, you, you might think that, you know, this was kind of just uh, noise. We can try another random signal with the same level. And oh, that, that time it stands out a little bit better. Here's a good example. You, would have, you wouldn't be able to see that there's a 12 hertz component here. OK, so that's a little bit about uh, spectral analysis. And uh, yeah, now I want to show you an example, uh, static spectrum from, from real EEG data. <clears throat> so. This is, uh, let's see, I'll clear the workspace and load in this data. And we can see what this contains. So we have um, one variable called EEG data. It's a vector, so it's just a time series. And, uh, and then we have a sampling rate, which is uh, one kilohertz. So 1,000 times or 1,024 times per second, we were measuring the electrical activity. This is from resting state, so uh, the participant was just sitting in a quiet room doing nothing in particular. Uh, I think this is two minutes, let's see. Yeah, so this is 120 seconds of data from one channel, and this is just what the, the raw data look like. So now we have a question, and uh, what are the prominent spectral features? Zoom in and count. Okay, so what we're going to do now is just you know, zoom in to a random time point, so a uh, random time window. So let's take a one second window that goes here. So this is second 44 and second 45. So you can see that there is this prominent wiggle. Well, you can see there's many, you know, there's many features that, that you can see here. Uh, so there's like these faster 
fluctuations, but also this, this thing here is pretty clear. In fact, we could see it even more clearly when zooming out. So you can see that there's these regular ups and downs. So let's zoom in. Maybe now I'll, I'll zoom into this time window here. Okay, so we are going to do super old school spectral analysis. You know, before there were computers, uh, people did spectral analysis by counting, you know, by, by eyeballing. So we're gonna do this old school. So here's a span of one second here, and we are just gonna count the number of times we see a peak on this fluctuation here. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So there's eleven of these, you know, this kind of these, these prominent peaks here, which is who knows what frequency band that's called, eleven hertz or eleven times in one second. Clemens knows. Nope, he doesn't know. <laughs> Good guess. It's not beta. It is alpha. Yes, thank you, Andy. Yeah, roughly 8 to 12 hertz. So we see, we just eyeballed and counted uh, 11 cycles in this, uh, in a span of, of one uh, second. So it's pretty neat. We can see this alpha oscillation directly in the data. And then this just gets back to the question earlier about the sinusoidality. So this is definitely not a pure sine wave, uh, but it's clearly rhythmic and sinusoidal. So it's pretty easy to see uh, where we can count these. And then, yeah, as I mentioned, there's there's a lot of other things happening in uh, in this signal as well. Okay, so next we take the uh, the FFT of the signal. And uh, yeah, these are just some some normalization factors here that that uh, I don't really need to worry about. Okay, so uh, I, I suppose at some point I made a claim that there are three prominent features in this power spectrum. What are they? So what are three features? What are three like things that visually pop out in in this power spectrum? There might be more than three. Yeah, good, Lotta. So there's one over F. What, what does one over F mean? Well, if F is frequency, then you can see that the amplitude is generally decreasing, or the power is generally decreasing with increasing frequency. So, uh, so that is a characteristic of pink noise, uh, which is one of the colors of, uh, of noise. Noise comes in, in different colors. Pink noise, biological noise, um, scale-free dynamics, uh, systems operating at or close to a critical state all exhibit this kind of 1 over F uh, dynamic, which is pretty interesting that the brain as a complex system also exhibits this uh, kind of 1 over F dynamic with decreasing power with increasing frequency. Great. So that's one feature. What else do you see? Judith is typing. Other people are talking with their microphones muted. <laughs> I live in Amsterdam, so you guys can yell as loud as you want, and I'm not going to hear you. <laughs> 50 hertz, yeah, great. That is a really prominent spike. Yeah, you call it. Uh, uh, yeah, you call it uh, electrical line noise uh, or power mains noise. So this is coming from the uh, the electrical um, uh, circuits that are in the uh, in the recording room. And then th the third thing that I would like to point out is this peak here. So you see that there's this kind of 1 over F decrease, and then this is a prominent divergence from the 1 over F. Maybe there's a little bit of uh, divergence here. And certainly this thing is a really narrow divergence. Now, this peak here is around uh, 10 hertz. So this is alpha. This is actually what we were uh, what we were counting here by eye, what we saw by visual inspection here. So, um, so you see that this is relatively wide and this is, is pretty narrow. So what can we infer about this thing being relatively wide in the frequency domain versus this thing being, being relatively narrow? What does that tell us that 
this feature is really uh, narrow, and this is is uh, still narrow in some sense, but it's certainly wide relative to this. Uh, yeah, not an outlier. Uh, let's see what Mauricio has to say. Signal power is higher, so that's the the uh, the the y-axis here. Higher, so there is a lot of energy in the signal at 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 fifty hertz. So one thing this is telling us is oh Daphne is going to type. Don't want to steal her answer. <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, so I guess the energy in general is just uh, so th there's a lot of terms in spectral analysis that are all used roughly interchangeably um, power and uh, amplitude. So power and amplitude are related because power is amplitude squared and energy uh, would also correspond to the power or the amplitude. So this y axis you could call power or amplitude or energy. Uh, so there's higher energy at 50 hertz. And it is, it is confusing because this is coming from the electrical sockets, basically all the, the, the wires running through the walls and the, and the floor. This is also coming from electricity, but this is the electrical energy in the brain, the electric fields in the brain. This is the electric fields coming from probably the computer monitor and the screen or something like that. Okay, but so um, one thing that this is telling us is that uh, this is a stationary signal and this is a non-stationary signal. So when you have non-stationarities, the frequency, the representation in the frequency domain becomes a little bit more spread out, a little bit more distributed. And I'll show you uh, more, even clearer examples of that in a moment. And then when you have um, stationary signals, you have uh, uh, narrower features in the power spectrum. So 50 hertz line noise is actually not a purely stationary uh, uh, feature because it's not exactly uh, uh, 50 hertz. There's like carrier frequencies and so on. And there's some, some non-linearities in the 50 hertz line noise. But that is, uh, it's, it's really narrow. And also, you know, the 50 hertz line noise is not altered by cognition. You know, the, the 10 hertz oscillation in your brain is dynamic. It's changing according to what's happening in your brain. Whereas the 50 hertz line noise is just humming along all the time. It's not affected by like cognitive processes or even power load or anything like that. So this is uh, a little bit of insight into uh, stationary, stationary features and non-stationary features. Okay, let's move forward. So now, uh, so, so this plot was created by taking one Fourier transform over the entire signal. So that means we take one Fourier transform over this entire two minute segment, all 120 seconds go into one Fourier transform. Now, uh, another way to, to approach spectral analysis of non-stationary signals is to do what's called Welch's method. And the, the, me the method itself is called Welch's method because it was originally developed by uh, this engineer named Welch in, uh, I think, in the 1950s or something. MATLAB does, uh, has a function P Welch, and I don't actually know what the, uh, I guess the P probably stands for power. <laughs> but anyway, um, so the way that Welch's method works is instead of taking one um, one Fourier transform or the entire signal. We take one Fourier transform over a window and then another Fourier transform over the next window and then a Fourier transform over the next window and so on. Now I already described something like this, which is uh, the way to create a spectrogram or time frequency plot one column at a time. Uh, but with Welch's method, we're actually going to average all of those segments together instead of separating them over time. So here is what this looks like. And uh, so then we have a question, how does this figure compare to the previous one? So let me pull this one out. So the figure on the left <coughs> is from taking one FFT over the entire signal. 
And then this is from uh, Welch's method. So how do they, so someone talk about these, these two figures? What, what would you say is uh, different between them or similar between them? Do they, they look really similar or really different? What do you notice? You can also feel free to, to unmute your mic if, if your you know, fingers are tired of typing. Yeah, that's an interesting observation, Emma. So uh, looks like the, the envelope over the peak that I showed with the Hilbert thingy. Um, so uh, in fact, th those both show smooth uh, time courses, but they are they are quite different actually. And that's because this uh, the x-axis here is frequency. So here we're looking at the spectrum, whereas with the uh, Hilbert transform, there, the x-axis is time. So we do get a smoothed version in both cases. But in this case, uh, with the Hilbert transform, it's actually uh, the envelope over time. Uh, and and uh, let's see here, we have the envelope over uh, frequency or the power spectrum on the frequency. Yeah, so then Judith says uh, this one shows the, the dynamics much more clearly. Yeah, that's definitely true. So all of these, you know, this, all of this, like, um, I don't know, texture, like high spatial frequency stuff, all of these spikes are coming from non-stationarities in the signal. And Welch's method is pretty good about smoothing over them, in part because you're averaging together many different segments of the uh, of the signal. And I, I don't know what, I don't remember what uh, parameters I specified in here, but, uh, uh, two second windows. Okay, so in fact, uh, let's see, this spectrum here, Welch's method, is the average of 60 spectra. So you take the spectrum of a two second segment and then another two second segment, and that gives you 60 segments, and then this is the average over all 60 segments. Yeah, so this, uh, this is going to give you a smoother version because we're smoothing out, you know, we can basically, uh, essentially what we're doing is assuming that um, a lot of these little local stationarities are just noise. And so by averaging over a lot of different segments, uh, we are smoothing out a lot of the noise. Yeah, definitely, uh, Judith. Uh, so we can definitely average out important features of the signal. There's definitely uh, a lot of stuff that's gonna be uh, missing from this spectrum that, uh, that is is present in this spectrum that we are going through, and that's a, a great segue to uh, to the next section. But let's see, Andy has a question. Yeah, that that's right. Um, so you take a Fourier transform of this time window, and then a Fourier transform of this time window, and a Fourier transform of this time window, and so on. Then you extract the power spectrum from each of these little windows, and then you average all of them together, uh, and that's how you get something like this. Now it turns out that that is basically equivalent to averaging a time frequency plot over all of the time points, and that's something I'm going to show you in uh, yeah in, in a few moments. Let's see. Ah, so Clemens asks a good question: Would it be more accurate if we had smaller time windows here? Uh, or larger time windows. So the answer is, uh, yeah, it it gets kind of tricky in the in the Fourier transform. So there's there's a lot of detail uh, about the Fourier transform, and uh, we could easily spend, you know, two weeks uh, just talking about the Fourier transform. So the the concept of the Fourier transform is simple, but there's there's a lot of details. Uh, that uh, become uh, that are, are more important but subtle. One of them is that the frequency resolution is determined by the number of time points. So also part of the reason why this is smoother is that there's just fewer frequencies here than there are here in this full power spectrum. Uh, so would it be better to, you know, if if you would, essentially what would happen is if you would make the time windows smaller, 
then uh, you would actually be sacrificing information in the uh, in the, the frequency domain, although you would be able to get more information about the temporal dynamics. That's a bit of a trade-off. The, the more you zoom into time, the less information you have about the, the spectral characteristics. Okay, so, so now I'm gonna uh, move on and show you some effects of non-stationarities. So what I'm going to do is create some signals that have non-stationary features, and we will look at their power spectra and see what they look like. Okay, so I'm gonna actually first start by showing you two spectra without showing you first the time domain signal. So. Uh, so, so this is blank. This is a, a picture of uh, of bunny rabbits playing in the snow, and here we have the the. I'm just kidding, by the way. Yeah, it's like the the annoying part for me about doing teaching like this is, you know, I tell these stupid jokes, and I have no idea if you guys are like laughing or rolling your eyes or walking out the door or anything. But uh, anyway, um, so uh, so there's two signals that I'm I'm not showing you here, and here we see there. Uh, their their power spectra, their amplitude spectra. So the question is, what do you think uh, the the red signal is going to look like? So based on this frequency, based on this uh, power spectrum, what do you think the red signal looks like in the time domain? A clear sine wave. Yeah, exactly. Lots of so. It's going to be a pure sine wave at four hertz. So it's going to be four cycles per second. This is a time window of one second here. So we expect four uh, cycles, although I think it's actually more than four. Yeah, it's, it's a total of 10 seconds. But uh, anyway, uh, but, but this is going to be a four hertz time. How about, how about the blue spectrum? What do you think that one's going to look like? You can even, uh, let's see, I can zoom in this and you can see how it looks. So it's just, it's like a bunch of spikes at all these different frequencies. Very noisy. Okay. White noise. Yep. So you see this uh, kind of looks like the spectrum of white noise that I showed in the beginning here, right? So here I was showing, you know, I said that white noise is as a flat power spectrum. Now, in this case, of course, it's not perfectly flat because of random sampling of noise, but but white noise generally has a flat power spectrum. And that's what you see here. It's not totally flat across the entire frequency spectrum. So maybe what I did was take white noise and just you know clip off the frequencies a little bit below like two and above 10. Okay, so let's start with the first signal, uh, the red one. So basically now I'm just uncommenting this line and then I'll, I'll run this code again. Okay, so no big surprise here. We see that this is just a pure sine wave. And now let's plot the blue signal. And look at that. It is It doesn't look like noise at all. In fact, it still looks like a sine wave. Are you guys surprised to see this? Okay, two people are surprised. Other people are nodding their heads or something, or they're not surprised. OK, so what is going on here? Well, what's going on here is that this is a non-stationary signal. So uh, this is a frequency non-stationary signal. The frequency of this signal is actually increasing over time. This is called A. Does anyone know what this kind of signal is called when the, the amplitude is constant, but the frequency is changing over time? How about, I'll give you a hint, if we would play this, uh, like make a sound of this sine wave, it would sound like this. Yeah, riser sound like in EDM, I'm not sure what EDM is, but anyway, it's called a uh, chirp. Ah, uh, EDM is electronic dance music. God, am I so old? I think I've been listening to EDM since the 90s. I never knew it was called EDM. Okay, uh, 
So anyway, it, uh, the term doesn't matter. This is called a chirp. A chirp is a signal that changes in frequency over time. Um, and so it's it's interesting. So you know, it's kind of striking to see. Now let me show both signals here at the same time. The red signal goes up to one as an amplitude of one in the time domain, and you see also very clearly in the frequency domain it has an amplitude of one. But the blue signal also has an ex exactly the same amplitude as the red signal. But in the frequency domain, the amplitude never gets above, you know, around uh, whatever these values are, around 0.1, maybe a little bit higher than 0.1. So that seems wrong, right? Now, the, the way to interpret this, the way to think about this is that, um, in the Fourier transform, you know, think about the Fourier transform as running in a loop over different frequencies. When you get to uh, the the when you get to the the sine wave at four hertz, imagine overlaying a four hertz uh, sine. Oh yeah, we don't have to imagine it; we have it right here. So imagine that the red line is uh, not the signal, but one frequency from the uh, Fourier transform, and then we're asking the question, you know. Does the signal look like this four hertz sine wave? Well, you know, we can go through visually. So here, I hope you guys can see my mouse clearly enough, but here at like 0.5 seconds, they do look kind of similar. And let's see here, they also look to be pretty similar to each other. Maybe here, they, the, the, the red line and the blue line look pretty similar to each other, but otherwise they, they look kind of orthogonal, like they're uncorrelated for most of this 10 second segment. So that means that a pure sine wave at four hertz is only going to be modestly correlated with this, uh, with the blue signal, with the chirp. And that's because the four hertz, the, the, the signal is only four hertz for a brief period of time. It starts off at uh, two hertz and it ends at 10 hertz. So it it looks like a four hertz sine wave for some period of time. Likewise, it looks like an eight hertz sine wave for some period of time, and then it doesn't look like an eight hertz sine wave anymore. It never looks like a 16 hertz sine wave, which is why uh, we get down here. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, the point of, of this demonstration is that um, when you have uh, non signals with non-stationarities in them, their power spectra can be difficult to interpret. And the stronger the non-stationarities, the weirder the power spectrum is going to look and the harder, the, the, yeah, the harder it's going to be to interpret it. And this is a motivation for doing uh, time result, temporally resolved spectral analysis, AKA time frequency analysis. So with that, this is you know normally in person, this would be, we'd stop the lecture now and go back to, uh, or stop MATLAB now and go back to lecture. But <clears throat> any other questions uh, about this before I, I move on? Um, how should you, so let's say that, that one sine wave, the red spike. So does that mean that if you, if you would see that in EEG data, um, is that a, a source that you can very clearly separate from the rest then? Um, yeah. Could you give like an example of what that could be in, yeah. for in real data analysis? Yeah, yeah, good question. So uh, the thing is, real brain activity is never so purely, so perfectly narrowband uh, because real brain activity is non-stationary, it's dynamic, it's changing over time. So in real data, if you see a, uh, a feature in the frequency domain, a spike in the frequency domain that's really narrow like that, it's, it can only be an artifact. So you would never see real data that's this incredibly narrow in the frequency domain. That's why, you know, when we talk about um, frequency bands in uh, in EEG activity or LFP activity, they're always called bands. You know, delta would be like one to five or one to four, theta from four to eight hertz, alpha from eight to twelve hertz. And the reason why people give them labels in uh, in those bands is because there are all sorts of temporal dynamics. So these these signals are are dynamic over time. So they're they're changing over time. In fact, we can probably find. You know, just by like poking around randomly, 
you can probably also find, yeah, so here, there isn't really a lot of alpha that I see in this randomly selected segment. So, so maybe there's, there's really no alpha over here. So uh, yeah, so, so certainly this would be useful for spectral separ uh, source separation. In this case, I would say, yeah, if this were empirical data, I would say this is noise, this is some artifact. Yeah, and if it's coming at four hertz, then there's something wrong with your equipment. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so now we are going to <clears throat> um, move to time frequency analysis. I'm going to start by showing you simulated data. And I'm going to create another chirp that's uh, similar to this one, just a different frequency range. So this chirp goes from 10 hertz to 30 hertz. This one went from 2 hertz to 10 hertz. And let's see. OK, so here we see the uh, signal. You can see, again, it's a sine wave that increases in frequency over the course of five seconds. Here is its power spectrum. And uh, yeah, you can see it's, it's plateau shaped. It looks a little bit similar to this one in the sense that this is also kind of a, a rounded plateau. OK, and then uh, what I'm going to do is create a time frequency plot using filter Hilbert. So I'll, I'll walk you through this code to make sure that it's clear how this gets mapped onto uh, the, 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 the slides. <clears throat> so I'm going to extract um, 50 frequencies between 5 hertz and 40 hertz. So with time frequency analysis, uh, it's a bit different from uh, Fourier transform or spectral based analyses where all the frequencies that are present in the data uh, sort of just come out automatically. Here we get to specify arbitrary frequency boundaries. So I'm going to uh, extract linearly spaced frequencies between uh, 5 hertz and 40 hertz. Okay, and then uh, for the, so one of the parameters of a Gaussian is the width of the parameter. Um, and I, I don't, didn't talk about that in, in a class, but it's basically how wide this, uh, this Gaussian is. So you can imagine making this Gaussian wider and you would include more frequencies or making it really, really narrow. And then you have uh, a much more restricted uh, filter, uh, spectrally restricted. So this is the parameter of the analysis and here I'm specifying it to be uh, six Hertz wide. Okay, so then we loop over all of the frequencies and here um, I am filtering the data. So this is a function that I included in the zip file and we can open up this function and I will just show you very quickly what we're doing in this function. So here we create a, uh, a Gaussian so let's see, if you're familiar with the formula for Gaussian, you'll recognize this line. This is e to the minus x squared divided by some uh, normalization constant divided by uh, yeah, some, some uh, shape parameter. Uh, so this is the, the formula for Gaussian. So here we create a Gaussian in the frequency domain. And here is where I uh, multiply the, uh, the, the Fourier transform of the data by the Gaussian in the frequency domain. So if you're, you know, if you're if you're not like a MATLAB expert, I don't expect you to be able to understand everything that's going on just by looking at this. It's totally fine. But I do want to point out the the idea here. So we create a Gaussian in the frequency domain. That's this variable fx. We have our time domain data. We take the Fourier transform of the data and multiply the Fourier transform by the Gaussian. And then we take the inverse Fourier transform. And that is exactly what I uh, described here. So we take our time domain signal, take its uh, Fourier transform, multiply that by a Gaussian, and then take the inverse Fourier transform. And then this function itself doesn't do the Hilbert transform. Uh, we have to go back to here, so we get the narrowband filtered data here, and then I apply the Hilbert transform, and uh, then we can extract the ABS, which is the absolute value, that's the magnitude, and this gives me the, uh, the, the, the amplitude envelope of the signal, which is this red line up here. 
And then this is the amplitude envelope, and it's common in uh, in spectral analysis to to square the amplitude to get uh, power. So that's why I square this. So this gives us the uh, power time series, and that's it. Then I'm just saving this. This comment is actually not correct, but that's okay. Okay, so then run all this code. And now you see this looks brilliant. So this is our time frequency plot. So it's time, and uh, this is the same time axis as we have up here. Now, this is the frequency axis and uh, on the x-axis in this middle plot. And here in this time frequency plot, the y-axis is showing frequency. So the increase in energy here from 10 to 30 hertz is is this here from 10 to 30 hertz. So now with this time frequency plot, we basically fix the interpretability issue that we had here with this spectral, uh, static spectral analysis. So we can see that the spectrum is changing over time. And that's also what I was describing earlier, um, that in the Fourier transform, if you would take a sine wave at 20 hertz, you would find that that 20 hertz sine wave is totally uncorrelated with the signal here, totally uncorrelated with the signal here, and strongly correlated with the signal for only some brief period of time somewhere around here. And that's what you see here. So the 20 hertz signal is correlated with the, uh, yeah, 20 hertz sine wave is, uh, is correlated with the signal not here, and yes here, and then not here again. Okay, so then uh, the last thing I want to show you for, for this code here is um, that the static power spectrum is basically um, like a collapsed version of a time frequency plot. So let me do this in a new you note. Know, so I'm going to plot the frequencies that I uh, extracted from the signal here by um, TF. This is our time frequency matrix here. And now this is um, actually, it's actually frequencies by time, right? So it's 50 frequencies, 5,000 time points. So I'm going to take the average of TF over the second dimension, which is the uh, time dimension. So then you see that when we average over time, so it's like taking the, the marginal average here, uh, we get something that is approximately like this, uh, this thing here. So uh, the average over time in a time frequency plot is like a smoothed approximation or a smooth version of the static power spectrum. So uh, someone asked earlier if, uh, if there's information that we are losing here. Oh, I think that that question was in the context of here, whether uh, the uh, Welch's method is, is losing information. Uh, and the answer is, is yes, it's kind of uh, it's hiding information, and uh, and you see that the time frequency analysis allows us to recover the information. Again, all all of the temporal dynamics are technically in the Fourier transform; they're just really hard to interpret, or they're hard to to visualize here because the temporal dynamics are actually not in the power spectrum; they're in the the phase spectrum, and phase is just impossible to interpret. You know, we can say plot ABS FFT signal. Here's the power spectrum of the signal, and you can see. Let me uh, zoom in to now. Um, this x-axis here is not frequency in hertz; it's frequency in indices. <clears throat> uh, but you can see, you know, this is something we can sort of interpret. But then, if we plot the the phase angles, <clears throat> you know what? What the fuck do you make of this? <laughs> it's uh, it's, uh, it's really difficult to interpret the <clears throat> the phase spectrum. But this is where all of the uh, temporal dynamics are are hidden in the in the phases of the Fourier transform. All right, <clears throat> very good. So that's enough of uh, simulations. Let's go to real data. So we have, uh, so we're gonna load in some data that were measured from uh, V1. This is a recording of mouse uh, V1 primary visual cortex. And uh, this is from one channel in layer four. It's the layer of cortex that gets the primary uh, thalamic input. 
And so uh, what was happening in this experiment is uh, there was, uh, yeah, the, the room was dark and there was a visual stimulus. It was just a big checkerboard, but the stimulus doesn't really matter. That flashed on the screen at time zero. And then at uh, 500 milliseconds, that stimulus contrast reversed. So all the white squares turned into black squares and vice versa. So uh, and then this is the average over, um, I think, uh, 200 trials from one channel. So. 1500 time points, 200 trials. And this is the ERP, basically the, the trial average. And then here you see the power spectrum. Okay, and then, so this stuff I've already talked about uh, before. So now, uh, I don't know why I'm loading this data set in again. Let's see, ah, this is the full data set, I guess. So this has all 16 channels. Uh, so this was uh, the data come from a, uh, um, a a silicon probe with 16 channels. So there were 16 little tiny electrodes that were spaced throughout um, cortex. So 16 channels, 1500 time points, and 200 repetitions of this same visual stimulus. So and then let's see. So now we're we're just going to focus on data from uh, channel seven, and uh, of course you have the data and you have all the code. So if you're curious, I encourage you to explore what this looks like for different frequency ranges, different channels, and so on. So now I'm going to extract information from uh, from uh, 10 hertz up to 90 hertz in 30 steps. And let's see. So most of this code is basically the same as the code that I already explained uh, when I did the time frequency analysis of the chirp signal. So we loop over frequencies. We filter the data, narrowband filter the data. We take uh, or apply the Hilbert transform and then get the magnitude. And then uh, there's a new line here that wasn't there before. And that's because uh, we are averaging over the trials because here we actually get, uh, so this F dat very, actually, let, me, let me run some of this so I can show you what these data look like. So now this variable f dot is uh, it's a matrix because we have time by trials. Previously, I was only showing you data for one time vector. So, uh, so that means that this uh, uh, amplitude time series uh, or power time series is actually from all 200 trials. So then we average over the second dimension, which is uh, time, uh, or sorry, trials. So, so that gives us. Um, one trial average, uh, it's called amp TS, but probably should be called pow TS because it's it's power, but it doesn't matter. And then the other difference here is that I'm doing a baseline normalization. So I get the average power from a, a baseline time window. And there I define the baseline to be minus 0.4 seconds to minus 0.1 seconds. So that's basically this time window here. And then uh, I'm doing applying something called a decibel normalization. And you can see basically the idea is I'm taking the amplitude time series per frequency, it's just for one frequency, and dividing by the baseline power at that time uh, window. So essentially that's just correcting for however much power there was in the in the baseline time window. And then there's this 10 log 10 factor, but that's part of the decibel normalization. So the important thing is we're just dividing by baseline power. Uh, Judith asked, uh, is narrowband filtering the same as low pass filter? Good question. The answer is no. Um, and the difference is that um, a, a narrowband filter is going to attenuate frequencies below and above. A low pass filter means you are just passing the lower frequency. So a low pass filter would be like, imagine uh, if this uh, it wouldn't be a Gaussian anymore, but imagine you would take this Gaussian, this orange line, instead of it going down here, imagine it just kept, uh, it remained at a gain of one all the way here. So a low pass filter would mean that you pass all the frequencies below a certain cutoff and everything above that cutoff uh, is attenuated. And then of course the complement to that would be a high pass filter where you attenuate only the frequencies below a cutoff and none of the frequencies above a cutoff. So 
narrowband means uh, we get uh, only one restricted range and we have attenuation below and above. All right. So, so that's that. So you can see that uh, time frequency analysis is pretty straightforward. We can write out everything with just a, a handful of lines of code. Now there's more, you know, there, there's like some theory and some math to justify why these codes of why these lines of codes are are the correct lines of code. But um, but uh, in the, in the end, you know, the upshot is that it's not so difficult to do these kinds of analyses. Okay. So here we see what the data look like. And this is the time frequency plot. So here you see uh, time on the x-axis and frequency on the y-axis. Again, we're just going from 10 hertz up to 90 hertz here. So what are we looking at here? Well, we see that uh, there's actually multiple uh, dynamics that are happening at different ranges of, of gamma. So here during the first stimulus presentation, we have some 40 hertz uh, activity. And then this is pretty interesting. So after, remember the stimulus uh, phase reverses at 0.5 seconds. So here we have this response in the frequency domain uh, that shows us a uh, that the V1 is starting to oscillate at 60 hertz, but it's like spinning down. So this oscillation is getting slower and slower down to about like 45 hertz or whatever this frequency is here over time. So that's pretty neat. So there's already a pretty complex set of dynamics that uh, that, are you, that you don't see in the Fourier transform. In fact, you see, you know, this kind of explains why we see a couple of little peaks here. And it looks like this gamma activity is pretty broadly distributed in frequency. When you look at the time frequency plot, you see it's actually not that broadly distributed. So the frequency at any given time point or time, you know, little time segment, the frequency distribution is actually pretty narrow, but the frequencies are changing over time, just like in the chirp example. Uh, so the Fourier transform, the static Fourier transform is kind of giving us yeah, a picture that isn't really, I mean, it's not wrong, it's, it's accurate, but it, it's a little bit like misleading I think is the, would be the, the way to characterize that. Any questions? Shall we see what this looks like if we go a bit higher? Let's go up to, because we see some other stuff. Let's, uh, let me first just increase the spectral resolution here so we get more frequencies. So uh, it just sharpens it a little bit. And now let's go up to, uh, you tell me what, what frequency, sh what should be the maximum frequency here? The sampling rate is 760 Hertz. So we do have a fundamental limitation for how high we can go. 300 Hertz, all right. Daphne gets her wish. So this is also pretty neat. So before I cut it off at 90 Hertz. So in fact, you didn't see that there was um, even more stuff happening at higher frequencies. So we see another burst of even higher frequency activity around like 100 Hertz or so. And, uh, and then it looks like there's something even higher here. That's pretty neat. Lots of, uh, lots of dynamics in here. And then maybe I'll decrease the color scaling a little bit. Make it a little bit clear. What do you think, Daphne? <laughs> Maybe try higher. Hmm. Who can tell me what is the highest frequency that the laws of the universe tell us that we can go up to, given our sampling rate? Yeah, exactly. So highest frequency that we can extract is 381 hertz. That's because of something called the Nyquist frequency. Nyquist frequency, spelled like this. And uh, this gets deeper into a discussion of the Fourier transform. But basically, uh, the, uh, the, um, the fastest frequency in a signal that it's possible to reconstruct is one half of the sampling rate. So we already got up to 300 Hertz. 
and technically we can go up to 381 hertz but uh, when you get that high it starts to get a little bit um the snr starts to drop a little bit but we can still we can still run the analysis and see how it looks okay so not that much uh not, not much to see above around 160 or so hertz <clears throat> 